Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved, and long forgotten murders, all set within and beyond the West End. Today's episode is a two part series about the brutal murder of John Monkton, a devoted father and loyal husband who provided a safe and loving home for his family. But what began as a simple burglary left a family destroyed, having been confronted by the devil's child. Murder Mile is research used in authentic sources. It contains moments of satire, shock and grisly details. And as a dramatization of the real events, it may also feature loud and realistic sounds. So that, no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 131, The Trader and the Devil's Child, Part 1. Today, I'm standing on Upper Cheney Row in Chelsea, SW3. Three roads south of John George Haig's acid-soaked basement. One road southwest of the abortionist of Helen Mary Pickwood. A short hop from Battersea Park, where Freddie Mills loaned a rifle to end his life. And a few feet from the vicious attack, which left Sexton Robin McCarthy brain-damaged forever. Coming soon to Murder Mile. This is an exclusive part of Chelsea, between the River Thames and the supposedly fashionable King's Road. In the 60s it was hip, but now it's a flop, as any hint of originality has been diluted by an influx of self-obsessed tosspots with money but no style. So expect to see fur coats and facelifts, pompous turds in red trousers waffling on about portfolios, and overquaffered rats carried in designer handbags. In stark contrast, one road south is Upper Cheney Row, a very posh but oddly silent residential street full of family cars, a few trees, and four story terraces costing three to six million pounds apiece. Unlike the flashier parts of the city, where lavish drives and ornate gates adorn the tacky tasteless mansions of half-wits who wear their wealth. These homes are simple and understated, with nothing ostentatious on the outside, as anything of value is on the inside, hidden behind solid windows, locked doors and discreet alarms. But not everyone here is a resident, and it's fascinating to see who we allow in or near our homes, and who we don't as the difference between an open door and a locked one can sometimes be as subtle as an ID, a uniform, or a parcel. At 30 Upper Cheney Row, on the corner of Cheney Row and Glebe Place, sits a five-bedroomed, four-story brown brick townhouse. Back in 2004, this was the home of John Monkton, his wife and their two daughters. And as any family should, inside, they felt protected from any danger. And yet it was here, on Monday the 29th of November 2004, that all of their security became fruitless. When an innocent mistake, the kind we all make, destroyed a family forever. On the 13th of October 1955, John Victor Monkton was born into a long line of prestigious aristocrats. His cousin being Viscountess Monkton of Benchley and his great uncle Sir Walter was legal counsel to Edward VIII, who drafted the King's abdication statement, having chosen to marry Wallace Simpson. 
But what set John apart from many of the so-called elite wasn't his wealth, but his humanity. Goodness was in his blood, and kindness was in his bones. Physically, he was a striking man, exceptionally tall, but so slender he looked as if a stiff breeze might blow him over. Being bespectacled, with parted brown hair and thick arched eyebrows, he resembled a whip-smart man of maths. But what exuded most was his warmth, as among a big brain and deep pockets was a huge heart. Everyone described John the same way. He was gentle, thoughtful, loving and loyal. A man with a dry wit and a great intellect who genuinely cared for his fellow human beings, whether he knew them or not. In 1979, instead of going into law, he was drawn into the world of high finance. Across the 1980s, as yuppies in red braces reigned, waving phones as big as house bricks and quaffing cocaine by the kilo. As a Catholic, John was the opposite. A moral man who was old-fashioned, but effective. In 1996, he joined Legal in General and later became its managing director of Bonds, where his award-winning team managed £34 billion worth of assets, and John was regarded as one of Britain's most influential investors. Being raised to be successful, yet humble, neither fame nor money would ever change John. He dressed practically, he spoke in a quiet whisper, and although he was not averse to the odd luxury purchase, you could easily pass him in the street, unaware that the Sunday Times had listed him as one of Britain's wealthiest men. In his spare time, John had two passions, the church and his charity work. Praised as a man of deep Christian convictions, he was a devout parishioner at the Catholic Church of Our Most Holy Redeemer and a trustee of the Order of St. John's Care Trust, a non-profit charity providing care for the elderly. But as busy as he was, his work always came second to the most important thing in his life, his family. In the late 1980s, John fell in love with Homaira Taslimi, an Iranian lady who exuded both style and sophistication. Born in Tehran, educated in Washington, and having spent much of her life in France, with both of them being keen to settle down, on the 16th of July 1988, John and Homaira were married. In 1992, their daughter Sabrina was born, followed three years later by Isabel. And keen to keep his loved ones safe, in 1994, they moved into the affluent seclusion of 30 Upper Cheney Row, where they lived without worry. Hailed as an extraordinarily devoted family, it was the little things in life that John loved the most as although rich, above it all, he was a father and a husband, who always made time for meals, bathing his kids, reading bedtime stories, and wrapping his arms around his little girls with kisses and cuddles. John Monkton would do anything to protect his family, even if it meant giving his life. The most powerful word in the English language is home. A home isn't just a building, it's a sanctuary. It's the one place where every person has the right to feel safe. But what every homeowner fears the most is burglary. In 2005, a UK Home Office study questioned 82 burglars about their methods and motives. 
The average burglar is male, age 27, although many are under the age of 17. Younger burglars tend to steal through boredom or peer pressure, but the majority do it to feed a drink or drug habit. They steal from their own neighborhoods, they rarely travel, and they work in spurts, committing as many as 20 burglaries a week when their funds are low and their addiction is high. Many criminals see burglary as relatively low risk, as less than 20% of all burglaries lead to an offender being prosecuted. As for choosing a home to break into, half of all burglars return to a home they've broken into before, leaving a few weeks gap to allow the insurance to pay out and any items they've stolen to be replaced. A home's contents are easy for a burglar to value, as owners often leave their curtains open and dump the boxes of any expensive electrical items outside for the bin men to collect. Most burglaries occur on a weekday, between 3 and 4 p.m., when the owners are at work, at the shops, or on a school run, with an unoccupied house made obvious by a car gone and the curtains closed. The biggest help to any burglar is a broken light, a high hedge, and a dirty window, as these shield their criminal activities. Locks can be broken, windows can be smashed, and alarms aren't a deterrent, as although loud, mostly we all ignore them, but they do indicate that a home has items of high value. In fact, the biggest fear for a burglar isn't being caught, but confronted. Key to their success is to enter and leave a home, unseen and unheard. So often they will avoid any bright lights, gravel paths, squeaky gates, barking dogs, and best of all, any home which looks occupied, with the lights and the TV on. Burglars fit into three distinct types. A chancer, who sees an opportunity and steals items to be sold quickly. A creeper, who is skilled in housebreaking, has the patience to seek out high-value items, but like a chancer, avoids being seen at all costs. And finally, a confronter. A truly dangerous criminal, with no fear of being caught, and who will do anything to defend themselves and to get what they want. In 1994, when the Monktons moved into 30 Upper Cheney Row, they undertook a lot of renovations, including their home security. As a Victorian townhouse, it naturally had good defences. The windows were above head height, the walls were hard to scale, and they weren't accessible from the outside without a ladder. It had only two doors, one at the back which was well lit and alarmed, and one at the front, with its door sat on top of an awkwardly steep set of stone steps, fitted with locks, deadbolts, a chain and a spy hole, as well as a burglar alarm, a panic alarm and an intercom on several floors so they could answer the door without opening it. But even the best protection is embedded with a fatal flaw. John Monkton was a private man who did his job, loved his family, and never courted the limelight. Among a niche circle of bankers, priests, and charities, he was a celebrity of sorts. But even to those living on his own street, he was neither a name nor a face. And yet he came to one man's attention. In 2003 and 2004, he appeared in the Sunday Times Rich List and the Mail on Sunday's Rich Report, with a photo of his face and a profile on his life, featured alongside famous actors, pop stars, sports legends, royalty, millionaires and billionaires. For some, this is an ego trip. 
For John, it was a security risk. But for a very desperate criminal, with a history of violence, an obsession with the wealthy, who was sat amongst the squalor of his bail hostel in Streatham, barely a few months out of prison, this was the perfect way to compile a dossier on his potential targets. Only John was not his chosen victim. Like all cowards, this particular robber would pick on easy targets. Someone older, weaker and smaller. As he prowled the streets of Chelsea, not in search of a banker, but of a banker's wife, who dressed in designer outfits, with a bag full of cash and cards, and dripped in precious gems. All he would have to do is find her, follow her home, and wait until she was alone. Being a rich, petite woman, Homira Moncton was an easy target for the devil's child. Monday the 29th of November 2004 began like any ordinary day for John Moncton. An early start, few breaks and long hours in the cutthroat world of high finance where a doggy dog deal can be the difference between wealth or death, as a slew of savage rivals are wrestled and slain. It's an aggressive arena where only the bravest, the quickest and the strongest will survive. But the only splash of red which is spilt is the flush of shame and the stain of debt. As a bonds trader for the LNG Investment Group in the city's financial district, John's true strength was never his knuckles, but his numbers. For John, business was good. But his home was where he wanted to be. So at 6pm, he left. At 7pm, the suited and bespectacled man strolled into Upper Cheney Row. A dark, but soothingly silent street lined with familiar cars, a few trees, and no strangers or dangers. Just the shadow of his regular church, the soft glow of an old street lamp, and on the corner of Glebe Place, his home for the last decade. Through the curtains, he saw the familiar joy of the night ahead. In the basement kitchen, a meal was cooking. In the first floor lounge, the TV was on. And somewhere on the two floors above, maybe in the bedrooms, the playroom or the bathrooms, were his wife and daughter. As always, his long legs easily managed the steep Victorian steps up to the white front door, and only able to enter this house with a set of keys, as the toughened door closed behind him with a reliable thud. Its solid locks gave a reassuring click. with 12-year-old Sabrina at boarding school. Tonight, it was just the three of them. So although he missed her dearly, his home still radiated with the little things that he loved. The smell of a home-cooked dinner, the warmth of a fire, and the gentle splash as Elmira gave Isabel her bath before bedtime. Behind their windows, doors, alarms and locks, the Moncton family felt safe and secure. But they weren't. At 7.30pm, the doorbell rang. They weren't expecting a caller, especially not this late. So from the safety of the bedroom two floors above, Homira spoke to the guest via the intercom. As a calm voice replied, Postman, I've got a parcel here for a Mr. John V. Moncton. Which was odd, but not unusual, as although most people know the burglaries occur between 3 and 4 p.m., for couriers and delivery drivers, the work never stops. 
and although his arrival was unexpected, a locked door would always be open to a total stranger who carries something as subtle as an ID, a uniform, or a parcel. Homira called down, John, there's a parcel for you. As anyone would, he replied, okay, I'll deal with it. But as he walked to the door, he was rightfully cautious, and his security was there for a reason. Through the spy hole, John peeped. Its fisheye lens showed the obvious features of a delivery driver as being dressed in a black woolly hat, an orange and blue fluorescent jacket, and a postal sack over his shoulders. This young black youth with a baby face and a big smile held in his hand a brown parcel. He said he was a postman, and he looked like he was. Besides, most people know that burglars don't ring doorbells. But still, John was vigilant. So as he unlocked the door, he kept the security chain on. Hello? John inquired. As the postman smiled, Parcel for Mr. Moncton. John wasn't expecting one, but the name was right and the address was correct. And besides, most people know that the majority of burglars avoid entering an occupied home. So as the stranger called, he said, You'll need to sign for it. As we all would, John undid the chain, unclicked the lock, and as his last line of defence, he opened the door. But the postman was not alone. The second the door opened, John tried to slam it shut, screaming, No! 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 As hidden behind the postman's legs, a dark shadow was crouched. All dressed in black, a dark set of envious eyes peered through the jagged slits of a black blower claver, with a gun in his left hand and a six-inch blade in his right. Hearing the terror in her husband's voice, as he battled to force the front door shut to protect his wife and child, Homira joined John's struggle as pure evil invaded their home. And although the tall man and tiny lady pushed with all of their might, they were no match for a fake postman and the devil's child. Overwhelmed, as the door flew open, the postman grabbed John. And although not a fighter, being a foot taller with longer arms, he did his best to keep his attacker at bay. But John was not the target. With him distracted, like a coward, the devil's child went after the object of this robbery, his wife. Homira turned, as in her bedroom lay a panic alarm. One button, which when pressed, would activate the home's alarm and call the police. But as she ran up the stairs, without saying a single word, this seed of Satan stabbed the blade twice into her back and side. Struggling, she made it up to the first floor. But feeling a dampness in her back and no movement in her legs, she slumped onto the stairs as John fought on. In a voice as calm as death himself, the devil's child, whose real name was Damien, demanded, Give me your rings and your watch. Which he did. And although they were rich and she was well dressed, the pieces he took from her only looked expensive. So having taken her purse, it totaled barely £4,000. Beginning to black out, as the blood poured from her back, Homira screamed, John, I've been stabbed, as he wrestled Elliot, the baby-faced postman. Looking upstairs, he didn't see the epitome of evil coming towards him. All he saw was his beloved wife, 
ghostly white and drenched in red. And one floor above her, alerted by her mother's screams and peering through the banister, was Isabel. With two violent and dangerous men in his home, who would stop at nothing to get what they wanted. Although he wasn't a fighter, John would do anything to protect them, even if it meant his life. With his face beaten, as Elliot gripped him from behind in an immovable bear hug, John's fight to force both men out of his home and away from his family was failing. And yet it was then, without any warning, that the devil's child lashed out in a volley of frenzied stabs against an unarmed and outnumbered man. John's hands were slashed and bloodied as he valiantly fought off his attacker. As the stained six-inch blade sunk into his shoulder, his right arm and his pelvis. So ferocious was the assault that having mistakenly stabbed Elliot, with the full length of the blade, he buried the knife deep into John's chest as one wound ripped through his right lung and the last fatally skewered through this good man's heart. John slumped to the floor in the doorway of his lounge and as the robbers fled of Glee Place, Elliot whooped Oh man, you're the business! And Damien giddily fingered his haul of a few hundred pounds and some inexpensive costume jewellery as the two cowards left John and Hermira to die. which they would have done had it not been for Isabel, who was only nine years old. Doing as her mother said, Isabel locked the front door, called the police, and set off the panic alarm, alerting the street. Sat amongst the blood-splattered room, with Homira feeling weak, pale, and partially paralyzed, there was no denying that the quick thinking of this little girl had saved her mother's life. But with John lying motionless, his eyes closed, and his moans barely a whisper, even the paramedics couldn't save him. Isabel later stated, I knew my daddy was hurt in the heart. A heart which made him good, honest and loved. But having no pulse, and gone into cardiac arrest, although 49-year-old John Monkton arrived at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital at 8.10 p.m. 20 minutes later, he was pronounced dead. The next day, after hours of emergency surgery to save her life and having lost seven of her 10 pints of blood, although still in critical condition, from her bedside at St. Thomas's Hospital, Homira had the heartbreaking task of telling Isabel and her 12-year-old sister Sabrina that their father was dead. John Monkton was a good man, a loving father and a doting husband who had done, as we all would, everything to protect his family. But criminals are cunning and knowing how we think and seeing our weaknesses, he was duped by the kind of simple mistake that we all make. And although there's no mystery as why the Monktons were burgled, a few big questions remain. Who were the burglars? What drove them to steal? Why was Elliot actually there? And most importantly of all, who else is to blame for the murder of John Monkton, except for the devil's child? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. Part 2 and the final part of The Trader and the Devil's Child continues next week. If you enjoyed that, stay tuned for some extra tidbits and some aimless waffle after the break. Unless you don't want to, then don't. But before that, here's a true crime podcast which may very well be the equivalent of a Kit Kat but with the wafer bit missing. 
so all that's left is the lovely chocolatey bit. Mmm. The Evidence Locker is a weekly podcast about international true crime. Made by hardcore true crime fans, it's somewhat grungy. Hi, I'm Marie from Leeds in the UK, and my favourite episode is Death in a Funeral Hall. Hi, I'm Liz from Melbourne, Australia. My favourite episode is The Disappearance of Lars Mittank from Bulgaria. Hey, this is Will here from Cork in Ireland, and my favourite episode has to be Israel Murder at School. Fascinating story. Oh, hi there. My name's Conrad, and I'm from Lexington, Kentucky. And my favorite episode is the Atlas Vampire Murder. Join us as we explore the dark corners of the globe. Find us on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. A big thank you to my new Patreon supporters, who are Kylie Clark, Stephen Beeston, Karen Price, and Mads S. Olsen. I thank you all. I hope you're enjoying your new and exclusive Murder Mile goodies, as well as getting first dibs on the new exclusive Murder Mile mugs, featuring Reg Christie and Police Constable Arsenal Guinness. And a thank you to Kaylee, Nadine, and Peter Holloway, who sent very kind donations via the Murder Mile eShop and the supporter link which Eva has already spent on a little butler's bow tie for me to wear when I'm serving her her three o'clock cocktail. Plus an extra thank you to everyone who continues to listen to and enjoy Murder Mile. I thank you. Murder Mile is researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Thank you for listening and sleep well. So now the birds have shut up. Little blackbird outside. Uh, it's really I, I go uh, welcome to Extra Mile, everyone. Hey, uh, uh, unedited bit, blah blah blah. Not not essential. You don't need to listen to this if you don't want to. Blah 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 blah. We all know we all know that bit anyway. This is the waffly bit, unedited. But this is just me waffling on. I will give you some extra details in a bit. Um, woke up really early this morning because I'm not too far away from a couple of uh, little airports where all the little bastards who've got too much money and decide oh i know i'm going to get into my little two-seater i'm going to go and even though it's a tiny aircraft it makes a horrible little sound and you can hear it from bloody miles away and they do circuits over my head so i woke up really early to beat the um the uh, aircraft and uh, what have i got outside i've got a blackbird right outside my window it's like i want to shag i want to shag i want to shag which is basically what they do Randy little bastards, all they ever do is uh, eat and shag. Oh dear, sounds like Eva really. Right, uh, let's, uh, I'm just getting rid of the, uh, the the shield around my microphone. Let me go and pop on a cup of tea. I'm going to pop on a coffee. I ran out of coffee about 10 minutes in. Because the start, my brain wasn't functioning. I think that either it was too early or my brain wasn't functioning. I couldn't say words. So I drank most of my coffee at the start. And then I grab my water, which has got the little, those little orangey tablets that you put in the fizzy orangey tablets. I haven't got them with me. Uh, the vitamin C things. And it, it made, oh, it made the water too bitter. It's really hard to kind of say words when you got really bitter mouth. Anyway, right. Waffle, waffle. Yeah. If you're not used to extra mile, this is just regular waffle. And you're probably going, why, why do people listen to this? I don't know. I don't know at all. Just putting my, my water in. There we go, water in, yummy, yummy. I'm gonna open up a window. Oh, oh, hang on. Let's open up more windows. Uh, I didn't realize I hadn't unlocked them from the night before. Oh, there we go, right. Oh, fresh air. Lots of Tweety birds. Uh, no coots outside. I mean, I'm in a, I seem to be in a coot free area, although there is a moor hen. Which is a, uh, which is very excitable and having a bit of a flap at the moment. Uh, let's just get. Uh, I'm just getting the uh, the pillows from behind the cushions behind my head out of the way because they muffle some of the sound as well. Oops! Drop that. Oh, I've just dropped me uh, 
God, it's all falling apart now. My uh, little, uh, I just knocked off my, uh, oh, come on you bastard. I just knocked off my, uh, you're not the bastard. It's the uh, pop filter. Just couldn't remember the word of it then. A little, a little pop filter, which stops all the pop, 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 pop. I was listening to a podcast recently with uh, two comedians having a little chat. There seems to be a lot of co- podcasts about that out at the moment where comedians have a little chat together. Uh, but basically they try and segue in their regular material. Uh, and one of them, who has a very loud voice, doesn't have a pop filter. And therefore it sounded like this. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I'm hilarious. <laughs> and it's just like, oh God, I can't listen to your shit anymore because you haven't got a bloody pop filter cost 10 quid it's to go get a pair of socks or some tights that'll do it oh anyway anyway what else is going on in the world apart from waffle 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 um no cake no cake because i'm uh, i'm too far away from the shops at the moment i'm in a very remote area which is nice but there is a shop near me that does a nice uh apple pie Whoa. so the last two nights and for tonight i have custard and apple pie so that's my evening treat and it's a really nice thick apple pie as well yummy uh i've moved on again because we have to move on which is good uh the nice area that's good for walks the problem is it's been a little bit rainy and sunny at the moment which is fine but when you live near the canal it makes it turns it into mosquito and midges season so You'd be walking, like I walked along parts of the canal yesterday and for about 10 minutes all I did was I was just basically batting away thousands of midges and mosquitoes away from my face. Uh, and, and walking around, or what I did was I covered myself in citronella oil, put it on my glasses, put it everywhere, it still, you could, it still couldn't get rid of the bastards and then it started raining anyway so it got rid of the midges. And then I got attacked by a dog. Yay! Little, little f- French bulldog running up towards me uh barking and i thought oh it's gonna go on it, it just wants a stroke and it came up to me it bit my hand so i put my foot up to kind of defend myself again against it because i got um shorts on and i didn't want it to bite my legs uh and then its owners came behind and its owners didn't really didn't seem to give a shit i was like ah i've just been bitten by your dog and they were like oh he's just playing he's like mm, doesn't look like he's playing And they were walking by a nice little sign that said, please keep your dogs on the lead, animals about, and they did not give a shit. So, uh, yeah, uh, I will will inform the farmer. So the fact there's no animals in the field, but I just think if you can't control your dog and your dog bites people, put it on a fucking lead, you idiots. Uh, Anyway, uh, what what else is going on? Uh, I'm away from the area that had rats. I was in an area before that had rats, and I had my first rat on the boat. If you uh, subscribe to Patreon, you'll get you'll get a big chunk of an episode about about the rat that came on board and my battle to get rid of the the rat. Oh dear, he he was only on for like about I would probably say uh, the first bit for about three minutes, and then the oh, t- uh, coffee's up, and then the second bit he was on. Uh, hang on, Did I, I haven't even put my coffee in been waffling so much i haven't even put my coffee in hang on i'm gonna open up more windows cool it is cold out. all the windows are frosted up not frosted up but they've kind of got all conden- condensation hang on sugar in i'm gonna need two i've got lots of coffee it's just decaf it's uh powdered tea powdered coffee my brain is gone i've got uh, no sugar in my system right let's put the water in come on michael Come on, Michael. Brain work today. There we go. My coffee in a in a Murder Mile mug. Not a Reg Christie mug. Uh, not a Police Constable Arsenal Guinness mug. Um, yeah, because I've, I, I've they've all gone. They've all been sold, uh, which is great. Uh, if you if you're a subscriber to Patreon, I'm trying to make it a lot of exclusives on there to kind of get people to subscribe so uh if you are a patron subscriber i kind of i i get a very limited run of mugs and i put them on there and i go hey who wants the an exclusive mug an exclusive key ring and there we go so even i don't have them back to rat news uh yeah the rat came on the boat he i i thought he something flashed in front of my eyes my eyes aren't particularly good they're good for i, I can see i can see my laptop but Everything else beyond that is a bit blurry. It's a, I've got special contact lenses. They're designed to work that way. So I don't have good vision, but I've 
good for looking at a laptop and something blurred by and i was like it's probably nothing and then i checked the engine room and i saw something uh shifting in there and i thought it might be a cat so i i uh went around the, i locked whatever it is in the engine bay and then i went around the back of the boat and i opened the door and as i opened the door right next to my face was a big bloody rat and it, it scurried off so i locked all the windows and doors and went back into the boat and then i realized i locked it back into the boat because it had gone around the front and come back in the other way and then I realised I'd locked the rat between myself and the locked door. So there was basically a metre of space between me and the rat and the door. So I managed to get the rat out finally. God, dear, but ever since then, even though he has gone, he, there's no rat poo anywhere, which is great. And there's no scuffling. And, I've, I, you know, I've I've uh, put a bleach everywhere because they hate the smell of bleach and ammonia. And I've put peppermint everywhere because they hate the smell of peppermint. And as a last resort next to me for a couple of days i put rat traps which is the last room was all i thought if they're going to come near me i'm going to hear the snap but uh but everything else is designed to kind of repel them anyway do you know there's no reason why they should come on the boat and they haven't so it looked like it was just one chancer uh and i made enough noise i banged enough stuff to kind of scare him so he was like oh i'm not going to go back there so good i've got no rats but since then now i have rats in my vision so every like shadows move i think it's a rat so yeah not very good oh rats terrifying uh yeah fine as a pet i know people out there going oh i like rats rats are really nice i've got rats <laughs> yeah fine they're domesticated rats i'm sure they're lovely wild rats not if you want to trade up your lovely domesticated rats that live in a cage for some wild rats that go scurrying in the woods fine swap I doubt you will right what else is going on uh oh i've booked my train ticket to go and see my dad and my stepmom how exciting this is very good after two and a half years of not being able to see them because of you know all the stuff that went on with mum and gran and then uh, uh the pandemic so i so they've been in lockdown since since just before the pandemic actually happened i think they, they were in lockdown a, a month before it was announced that we we're going into lockdown uh, so we have we normally see each other every three months, but everything kind of went a bit weird. So uh, yeah, fine. After two and a half years, I'm going to get to see my dad and my stepmom, which would be lovely. That would be nice. Uh, which is why uh, Murder Mile walks are back. They're back on the last Sunday in June, which is good. Yeah, the, every Sunday after that, there's no private tours. So please don't message me asking for private tours. I'm not doing them at the moment. I just want to keep everything simple and try and get back into the track, uh, into the idea of doing it again uh which would be good um yes and and then hopefully hopefully i'll be going up back up to my old hometown i will get to see uh rich and neil and jason and hopefully we will get to go to a pub and i even did that a couple of days ago i went to a pub in Hampstead. very good actually thought it was quite good uh you, you very well done very covid safe you can only go in through one way you have to pre-book in you need to have the nhs app to get in there everyone needs to be wearing masks if they're moving when you're sitting down you've got to stay in your seat you can only have table service a maximum of two hours there and i thought it was all good it's like it, one of our friends joined us to have a conversation he wasn't actually sitting there he was on his bike cycling past and the guy came over he said i'm really sorry you can't have a seventh person having a conversation in it we've got to keep it right just in case because you know we could get shut down just for you having this extra conversation so it was very good very good i thought uh what else is going on i had me vaccine as well it's been a busy week had me vaccine which was good had no issues no side effects at all felt really good although to be honest because they can't last week's episode i thought i was a bit grumpy on that one uh wasn't in a good mood they cancelled my my vaccine for two days notice hadn't told me why they just said it cancelled and then they lost my nhs record so i had no nhs number so everything had gone really shit uh but then i i rebooked in instead of booking into a place which was just a mile away i, I ended up booking into a place which was 15 miles away so, uh it's a good hospital so i was like sod it I'll go, i'd rather go to a good hospital than a golf course so uh, I cycled the 15 miles in, had my jab, another 15 miles back. I thought, right, I'm going to get sick or fluey, as people say. So I bought lots of burgers and beers and get ready to get ill. Lots of TV ready, prep myself in advance. And instead, I got very pissed, which was very good. Very good. I had lots of good food. So uh, that was good. I uh, didn't feel terrible at all. I think I might have had a slight cold for about 20 minutes or something. 
Uh, but to be honest, I'd cycled 30 miles that day. The next day I did some work and then I cycled another 45 miles, went over to Hampstead and did some filming for Murder Mile, did 45 miles. By the time I got back, I think I was too tired to realise whether the vaccine had made me ill at all. So uh, that was all good. So I think that's a secret. If you are going to have your vaccine, my top tip is either do a shit ton of exercise uh, and really knacky yourself out or just get really pissed or do both as I did. They're all good. Uh, Right, let's do some questions and then we'll dive into some uh, stuff uh, to do with this episode. This is your first time with Extra Mile. You're probably going, what the frick is this? Well, this is Extra Mile. Um, (laughs) Don't ask. Right, question number one. Don't forget, these are uh, quiz questions. I might ball some of them up. Sometimes I might not. Uh, Question number one. What is the average age of a burglar? according to the the uh, uk home office uh census thing i added that last bit in uh what is the average age of a burglar let's just say that right question number two what is john's middle name question number three uh, uh name the three different types of burglar i kept having struggles say uh, with this episode i kept saying burglia and burglar uh, and things like that. It's, it's, I kept saying, just say fucking burglar. Uh, question four. Name the Monkton's two daughters. Ooh, someone's just started doing their mowing. That's a bit early for mowing. Question five. John Monkton's great uncle Sir Walter was legal advisor to who? Question six. I seem to be going... At the end of every answer. Question six. Homira was born in which country? Question seven. What is the average house price on Upper Cheney Row? Ooh, burpees. I got burpees all the way through that. I think because I had a uh, uh, um, uh, pate on toast for breakfast. Lovely. You needed to know that, didn't you? That was really essential. Question number eight. What is the name of the shoe shop Homira visited? Question number nine. What two colours were Elliot slash the postman's... Was the was Elliot slash... Fuck's sake. What two colours were Elliot slash the postman's fluorescent jacket? I'm glad I don't have to edit uh, extra mile. Uh, question number ten. This one's a really hard one. Uh, John's father's name was John, but what was his mother's name? Right, answers at the end of the show. I do actually have a little thing that I put at the end of my thing that says, answer the questions. Otherwise, I know that I will forget. Right, let's dive into some stuff. Just um, um, Next week's episode, we're going to dive into who uh, the postman and the devil's child were. We're going to do a, a, a look at the case from their perspective, because this is all primarily John's story. I, I made a conscious decision right at the start. I was like, I'm just going to tell John's story. Because if you, if you tell it all the multiple sides, it just makes it too complicated. But it's but there's an interesting kind of dichotomy between the postman and the devil's child. And that's what I wanted to focus on next week. So this is ju- this is just going to be about uh, John and his family. Uh, so yeah, uh, hopefully uh, I I can't post any pictures on social media because I uh, I I've already had someone get in touch with me from uh, I can't say which organisation but say you've been using copyrighted pictures so uh, either you take them down or we take you to court, uh, which is so I'm currently going through my website and getting rid of any uh, any uh, I actually thought I'd followed their website and I did their details correctly I thought but actually it turns out I balled them up so I've got to take them down and. I've been told to take them off social media as well, which would be a real pain in the ass because I've been uploading for ages. Warning to anyone: if you don't, if they're not your photos and you don't have the right to use them, uh, yeah, be careful. Luckily, that I've been given a warning as opposed to once uh, I, I was using some photos on my website, and there was four of them, and they charged me almost four hundred quid. And I was like, wow! And they're only tiny photos as well, bastards. Anyway. Um, what else uh right john monkton uh as if you look at the picture of john monkton he looks really lovely as well do you know he's really tall he, he's thin he's got big eyebrows a lovely big smile 
do you know he seems like a really nice guy very quiet but obviously very intelligent as well uh what initially i wasn't going to do this case because i thought stockbroker instantly thought went into my head and i thought i bet he's a twat i bet he's the kind of twat who does cocaine and you know treats people like shit and drives around in fancy cars and you know but when you when you look at him you just go he's a really nice guy isn't he 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 may be very rich and very posh but he's incredibly nice um so yeah do you know i came from a privileged life but obviously uh obviously uh whether it whether it was his religious background that drew him into this but he he very much seemed to be um uh you know, uh, interested in other people and their struggles and things things like that and and you know that is kind of reflected in his family as well his family seemed to be very close-knit and lovely and everyone seemed to like them and they got on really well and you know uh well it's just uh, uh, so i'm just i'm just reading through this is no good for you this is just uh me reading and you going uh well, well me going uh, making that noise um uh, i've also realized that when i write as well i make a uh, i make th- this noise i go mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i hum i hum the words i don't know why i keep doing it all the time uh anyway yeah uh very influential investor he said uh, one of the most influential investors of his generation within his specialist field he had a team of 25 people and uh had won an award for a bond fund um 34 billion pounds worth of assets they managed um everyone everyone seemed to like like him uh they said uh, john had a great intellect and was a man of uh, utmost integrity and kindness uh <coughs> uh he had a deep insight into the financial markets he built up a strong team who admired him greatly and will carry on his work um uh, there's one photo that i managed to get of john which is him on the um on the trading floor of the euro dollar pit in the chicago mercantile exchange at the close of the financial year and you know he look he looks like he's having a good time he, he you know he clearly knows what he's doing but as mentioned you know he's a very very wealthy man but also very humble as well you know don't think he really liked the fact that he was on the sunday times rich list and he was one of britain's wealthiest men listed on there i think he, he's one of these people who just like to keep under the radar uh, as mentioned he was a trustee of the orders of st john care trust which is a non-profit organization providing quality care and accommodation for the elderly and it runs care homes across the country um uh what was the other thing uh, the, the religious bit i'm going to go to that uh so he's a devout roman, roman catholic a regular parishioner at the Cath- catholic church of our most holy redeemer which is immediately opposite his home and that's the place where i mentioned that at the start that the the sexton who uh it's an antiquated word but the sexton who was uh who who ran that robin mccarthy uh was uh badly beaten and left brain damaged and that's immediately opposite his house like it's 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 the nearest building pretty much um uh john also joined the sovereign military order of malta which is a catholic religious order in 1977 uh they said he was a man of deep christian convictions and he worked hard for christian charities uh what else was there yeah he just seems just seems to come across as quite quite a nice guy quite a a little bit shy a little bit quiet but that's 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 a good thing often you kind of find that the people who are kind of loud and mouthy they're the ones that are desperate to prove who they are whereas the people who are quiet are kind of you know they know who they are they've got nothing to prove it's always the same isn't it you always you always see that this i think there's, there's three types of people in the world the people who are good at things the people who are good at saying that they're good at things and then you get the rare types who are good at things and actually good at telling people that they're good at things that's the hard thing isn't it if you're good at doing something it's hard to say hey i'm good at doing something but unfortunately especially at the the bbc when i I used to work there there'd be quite a few people there who i'll be honest were all mouth and no trousers it's quite a few people who were very good at saying oh yeah this is my project and i'm all responsible for this because it's a success yeah but actually it was a team effort and they were actually a small piece of the cog oh i'm not going to go into details about that but there's a lot of pricks there i'll be honest about that glad not to be there anymore do miss some of the people who work there some of the people i don't miss right <laughs> uh, the robbery let's dive into the robbery um as mentioned a good security in the house do you know even on the door he got, he got locks he's got deadbolts 
It was a UPVC door, which is one of those ones that hard hard to break down. Uh, he got a spy hole. He got, um, do you know, there was an alarm, a panic alarm, do you know, but it wasn't overdone. Do you know, it, it, from the outside, you don't see cameras all over it. You don't see something big that says, oh, this is a, this is a house is alarmed. Oh, this house is protected by dogs. It looks discreet. But obviously everything was there and secure. So, um, do you know, obviously people aren't expecting a home invasion. I think that's what I'm trying to get across in this story that people aren't expecting people. If you're going to be burgled, you're going to expect to come back to your house and go, oh, God, the window smashed. The door's broken. Someone's got in. Oh, no. Uh, you know, there's stuff scattered everywhere. That's what you expect. What you don't expect is someone to ring your doorbell and go, hello, can you let me in? I'm blah, 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 blah. You know. Uh, as happened with this one, Do you know the the um, the postman idea seems to be uh, one that they thought would work, and it did work. Do you know it's it's one that we're all culpable of. Do you know if you think about it, it's like I got a message on my phone the other day from uh, a delivery company that said we tried to deliver it to you today, but you couldn't. Uh, you need to call this number. It was it was allegedly from Hermes, but it wasn't from Hermes. Uh, or herpes, as I like to call it, and it, it, it said you need to call this number to rearrange, and it will cost one fifty to rearrange. And do you know everyone will go? Well, it's only one fifty. I need, I need whatever that parcel is. I'll have it. And I just thought, sod it. I'm not going to collect it. Do you know? I'm always even a couple of weeks ago. I had one where they they they, they said they tried to deliver but didn't. I was like, mm, you tried to deliver at lunchtime, and it's my PO box, and uh, they were definitely in because I called them. Uh, it, what actually happened was my PO box people uh, looked at the parcel. Went, no, he doesn't. He, he doesn't have a box here. It was a new person. They hadn't done their job properly. Uh, so actually, the the um, I was sent a, a reschedule thing. And what I actually did was I called up the guy who sent me the parcel because I knew what parcel it was. And I said, "Did you try and did they try and deliver it?" He was like, "Yeah, they tried today at this time." And I was like, "Right, I will I will go to this website and read range." And luckily, the 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 courier called me. It was great courier. It was like literally before he was like, "Oh mate, yeah, I tried to deliver this yesterday, but they wouldn't accept it." And I, it's this is definitely the building. And I was like, "Yeah." And it was like, "I'm going to keep you on the phone. I'm going to walk into the room. Uh, I'm going to speak to the same guy because it's the same guy again, and keep you on the phone. And then you can confirm to him that this is where your parcel belongs to." And that was like job done. Good for him. Good for me. Uh, oh yeah. But, do you know, it's easy to be scammed by things. Do you know these kind of uh, text scams and things like that? Like when you get one that says, uh, you need to uh, update your details with Lloyds Bank. And you think, mm, I don't have an account with Lloyds Bank. Do you know, it's easy to get scammed the second you press that button. They've got access to your phone. They've got access to anything you do after that. All of your login details, they can they can track all of that. So, uh, yeah, just just delete them straight away. Oh, I've got burpees. I've got coffee and pate burpees. Lovely. Eva's going to want to kiss me today, isn't she? Yeah, she always wants to kiss me. Always wants to kiss me. Right. Uh, what else do we have? So the spy hole. Um, we, we're going to... Uh, the, the, the uniform wasn't particularly good. I think the, the idea was to uh because you only really need to, to to see that it's a postman from a distance you know no one really looks at details too well all they really needed was for john to open the door so uh those who saw it said it looked like a kind of postman pat style you know the, the cartoon character from the 1980 1990s and there's a remake recently um so it's kind of he's got a woolly hat he's got a uh, fluorescent jacket on whose colors i won't mention because that's in the quiz and he got kind of the, the postman's bag over his shoulder. And if you think about it, you know, official Royal Mail postmen have a specific type of colour. But we live in an era where there's you know, there's loads of different delivery companies. So if someone goes postman, delivery driver, courier, it could be any. It could be Herme Herpes. It could be, you know, Amazon. It's, you know, and now you've kind of got the... the delivery drivers delivering stuff it's like there's so many delivery companies and there's you know it's hard to pin down who has a uniform anymore so uh i think that makes it very difficult for people uh so do you know even though his uniform may not have said royal mail on it you know he would have looked like a delivery driver so that's good enough and he's holding a parcel so uh i don't want to tell you too much of it no I'm, there's, there's bits that i'm not going to tell you for this because i want to save it for next week's episode because the 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 connections between the postman and the uh the devil's child are kind of interesting 
Um, what was stolen? I kind of glossed over it a bit. Uh, Homira said, uh, obviously, she was uh, conscious for most of this. She did kind of black out during part of it, as you can appreciate. She'd been stabbed in the back and the side, and she was losing a lot of blood. So she did she did amazingly well just to be able to regain consciousness there. Uh, she told the court, I did not know I was stabbed. There was no pain, uh, but I could not feel anything in my, leg, my legs. I sat down, and I could see my husband defending himself with another man. That's Elliot, the postman. Uh, Mrs Monkton said that one of the men demanded her jewellery in a shockingly calm voice. He took rings worth €1,000 apiece, a pair of costume jewellery earrings and a, a £2,500 watch. So that's the most expensive item they got was the, the watch. But even that, when you think about it, 2500 quid for a watch, it's like... You know they've got three three uh, no a five point five million pound house so obviously these guys were expecting her watch to be twenty thirty fifty grand something like that but it's you know clearly she's she likes fashion but she's obviously quite a frugal lady you know she spends it on things that she likes as opposed to just flashy shit. Uh, Homira managed to make her way upstairs to the first flight of stairs before feeling a dampness a heat and a paralysis causing her to sit down. Uh, she told John that she was bleeding. Um, uh, uh, Elliot uh, by this point had pulled down his baraclava over his eyes so all they could see was his kind of eye holes in his mouth uh, uh, and the same with uh, the devil's child Damien he was uh, he had his uh, uh, baraclava over his face as well what was taken uh, so it's a pair of earrings two diamond and emerald rings a watch and a purse which they said was roughly four thousand um, pounds uh, i think that was it uh, she told the court uh, now i focused on my husband he was struggling and i was thinking that i was dying but he would survive he looked so strong he was fighting still holding the man's wrists uh, i screamed to my husband that i'd been stabbed but i don't think i said it many times i think i fainted I sat down and I could see my husband defending himself. Uh, I could see my husband holding his arms up high, holding another man's hands in front of him, above his head, away from him. Um, I did not say anything. I was stabbed. I sat down. I could not move my legs. Uh, God, that must be a horrible feeling. Like, you know, her husband is being attacked and she can't she can't move and she's passing out at the same time. Um during the attack, uh, Isabel, who was one floor above, so obviously you got the ground floor, the first floor, and the second floor. Uh, Isabel was on the second floor. She heard her mother screaming and came to the landing and looked downstairs. Uh, she saw a man on the stairs wearing what she described as black clothing. We'll go into this further next week. I'm going to be careful what I say here. Uh, she remained upstairs, although she could hear her mother screaming. Um she later gave a pre-recorded interview to uh, uh, to CID uh, where they got like a, a child specialist to sit down in front of her and, and get her to go through all the details of what she saw that night. Uh, uh, Elliot punched John quite a few times in the face and then held him in a bear hug um, as Mr Monkton fought for his life. Uh, this was all in kind of the doorway of uh, between the front door and the lounge. Uh, in total, John was stabbed um, multiple times. Uh, so he got wounds to both hands. Uh, so they're defensive wounds. A two-meter stab wound to the right, to the shoulder blade. A five-centimeter stab wound to the upper right part of the elv to the pelvis. Uh, a, a stab wound through the upper right arm. An eleven-centimeter deep wound, uh, which incised his rib and entered his right lung and a 12 centimeter deep wound to the heart that went right through his heart so pretty much you know chance of surviving that is is uh well not great uh, i'm gonna be careful no, i think i'm not gonna give you too much here because I, I i i've got I've still got to write next week's episode and I, you know i don't want to give stuff away here that will be in next week's episode that's always the problem with multi-parters on uh extra mile um as mentioned you know uh um isabel heard her mother screams as mentioned uh her mum's still on the first floor landing she can't move her legs she's passing out but uh you know she uh 
She called to her daughter and said, help, is he? Uh, who ran downstairs, put the chain on the door and called the police. It, uh, and then uh, uh, it looks like she set off the uh, panic alarm. Uh, I can't actually find the details of it here, but the but the the, the uh, witnesses did say that they heard the alarm going off. And there's you know, given the fact that John's collapsed on the floor downstairs, the door is locked, the robbers have gone, and the mum's paralysed. There's only one person who could have switched it off. So I've put in the episode that she set off the panic alarm because she's the only person who could have. Uh, uh, she ran downstairs and she said she saw blood all over the floor and the walls. Her mother had been stabbed twice in the back and was lying at that point lying at the bottom of the stairs. Um, so she calls for an ambulance. Uh, where was... Yeah. Uh, so uh, at this point, John is dying. Homira has passed out and is bleeding, and her daughter obviously is traumatized. Um, it's hard for the police to get information out of them. Uh, police initially couldn't get into the Monkton's house because Isabel, quite rightly, had locked the door. Uh, so she had to she had to hand the key through the letterbox uh, so the officer could actually unchain it, and then he actually unfastened the door because it had been uh, chained as well. Uh, uh, when they arrived um, Mrs Moncton was uh, conscious but uh, badly bleeding very pale uh, her breathing was shallow and irregular and her condition was deteriorating fast uh, she was given CPR by both the police and the staff um, lying in the doorway to the lounge was John Moncton he was on his back he had blood all over his chest he was not moving and after checking uh, for signs of life, the first officer on the scene could not feel a pulse. Ambulance staff who attended to John found that his breathing had become suspended uh, and he was in cardiac arrest. They did CPR in the house and drove him to uh, Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, which is the nearest, but he died shortly afterwards. Um, that is all I'm going to give you on that one because next week's episode, there's a lot to cover in that. Um, and to be honest, I think there's going to be a lot in Extra Mile as well because there's, I, I researched a lot for this and uh, there's a lot of details that I, I think I might gloss over just for the sake of clarity, but uh, we'll find out next week. I haven't written it yet, so uh, no point talking about stuff that I haven't written about. Right, answers to the questions. Here we go. Get yourselves ready. Uh, question number one. What is the average age of a burglar? They are... 27 uh they say 27 they they say that the um many seem to start around the age of 23 but there's quite a few who are kind of 17 and under so there's there's a real kind of discrepancy so uh, obviously as mentioned before a lot of them seem to do it because of peer pressure uh, and boredom and then there's that kind of gap where it seems to be like young men get into their uh early 20s they don't really have a job they start getting into drugs and drinking and that's when they become burglars so yeah but so average age is 27 which is interesting i thought it would have been a lot younger uh, what is john's middle name it is victor name the three types of burglar there's a chancer a creeper and a confronter and we'll dive more into those next week as long as I remember to do that. Uh, uh, question four. Name John. Uh, name the Monkton's two daughters. I, probably, I mean, I mentioned... I think I mentioned two of them in, in that bit. Then it was uh, Isabel and Sabrina. Uh, question five. John Monkton's great-uncle Sir Walter was legal advisor to who? That was King Edward VIII. That's the... That's the uh, uh, I, I, I shall be abdicating for the woman I love. That one. You married Wallace Simpson. Uh, question six. Homira was born in which country? Uh, it's Iran. Question seven. What's the average house price on Upper Cheney Row? It's between three and six million pounds. Which is interesting, as mentioned at the start, they're not very flashy houses. They look kind of Edwardian, Victorian kind of terrestrial houses. And they're quite plain on the outside, but clearly, you know, 
if you were to go inside, be expensive, you know, lots of lots of bedrooms, probably two kitchens, probably a cinema room, do you know, some of them probably got pools, do you know. So uh yeah. Uh question eight. Uh what's the name of the shoe shop Homeira visited? It's called uh Via Venisi or Via Venice, you can call it, but it's Via Venisi. Um uh, question nine. What two colours were Elliot slash the postman's fluorescent jacket? Those orange and blue. And question ten. A really hard question. John's father's name was John, but what was his mother's name? It was Emily. There we go. That's that. That's all good and done. Whew, hope you enjoyed that. Oh, that was a burpee then. Sorry about that. That was disgusting. I'm going to start editing this. Oh, this will be another three-day slog. Hopefully it won't be as difficult as last week's episode, The Falling Man. That was bloody difficult. If you uh, if you subscribe via Patreon and you're uh, in the uh, Handsome Hamlet or above category, uh, you will get uh, Walk With Me, the, the episodes that I, I record after I've edited uh each episode of murder mile and i give you kind of an insight into how it was edited and all the little secrets that are hidden in there and things that have snuck away that i cut that i won't know about while doing extra mile because i haven't edited it yet uh you've just heard it, the edited version but i haven't edited it yet this is this is recorded after i've recorded it before i've edited it whereas what with me is recorded after i've edited uh so yeah uh, falling man was really difficult to to edit it was a real nightmare hope people enjoyed it it was a very diff different one to what i'd normally do and that was the whole point but yeah very complicated hopefully this will be a nice simple one fingers crossed michael let's try not to make it too difficult good that's the end of this episode hope you enjoyed that uh, we'll be back next week for more fun and part two of The Trader and the Devil's Child. Have yourself a good week. Be good. Lots of love. Stay safe. Bye.